There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. Let's return in the Word of God again to Acts chapter 6. Do you have it open there in front of you? We read the opening verses of this chapter and studied it in the early Bible study hour. What a passage it is. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Growing up, I always hated multiplication problems. Don't you hate multiplication problems? This is the ultimate multiplication problem. The church is growing and things are going forward and God is blessing. Somebody says, oh, they must not have any problems then. No, no, the exact opposite is true because when you're moving forward, the devil's always going to press back against that. And so opposition arises, dissension, division among the people. You think, you think the worst battles come from outside. I tell you, the worst battles come from inside. And it's not the world that you have to worry about. It's when God's people can't get along and when the Lord's people can't move forward together. And so they had to work through all of that. And thank God they were spiritual enough they did that that very thing. No perfect church, but there is a perfect Christ. Amen to that. And so what did they do? They designated what we now call the first deacons. I heard you say that our brother had served as a deacon. And the word deacon just means servant. It's people that are, are appointed by the church. Uh, to come alongside the, the servant of God, the pastor, and, and help the church move forward and care for things and serve. That's what the word means. And so these are the first deacons. But I want to draw your attention to one man in the list. Would you look at the list? There are seven of them found in verse number 5. The Bible says, The saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And here's our man. Would you say his name with me, church? Philip. And Prochorus, and the Canner, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. I'd like you to take your pen out, if you will, and circle in the heart of verse number 5 this name, Philip. It is the first mention of this man. Though it's a uh, familiar name, it's the first mention of this particular Philip in the New Testament. Then do something. Hold your place. Don't lose your spot. We're coming right back. I want you to turn over in the book of Acts, just a few pages, to Acts chapter 21. And now I want to show you the last mention of Philip. Before we're done this week, we'll look at every mention of Philip, and we'll come full circle back to Acts 21 at the end of our study. But like bookends on his life, I want you to see the start and the finish. The first mention, Acts chapter 6. The last mention, Acts chapter 21. And verse number 8, and the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of, what's the name, church? There he is again. This time, he's designated just a little differently, Philip the Evangelist. We know he's the same man because the Bible says, which was one of the seven and abode with him. So would you mark in Acts 21 and verse number 8, Philip the evangelist. In Acts chapter 6, we get a little glimpse of Philip the deacon. Uh, how many of you are or have served as a deacon? Would you raise your hand, please? Oh, that's wonderful. And you know, I hear people sometimes making jokes about deacons and that kind of thing. I, I'm not into that because I believe there are two offices in the local New Testament church. There's pastor and deacon, and both of them were the Lord's idea. And so I love it when, when pastor and deacon are pulling together in the work of the Lord, moving forward for the glory of God. It's not the pastor's church, and it's not the deacon's church. It's Jesus' church. And the reality is the Lord's the head of the church, and all of us just finding our place and doing our part. When I think of deacons, I think of my 
<clears throat> great great grandfather. He was, I didn't know him, of course, but he was a, a faithful man and he was a deacon. And he led the singing in their church there on the Ohio River till he was 98 years of age. Can you imagine that? When he was 98, he was leading, singing, and serving as a deacon. And I just, every time I think about deacons, I think about men like that who've given themselves to the Lord and the church, and may God bless every one of them, and may the Lord multiply their kind. And then, when you come to Acts 21, he is seen not as Philip the deacon, he is seen as Philip the evangelist. And very frequently, people say to me, Brother Paul is an evangelist, and folks say, what is that? Does that just mean you travel around preaching sermons? Heaven help, I hope not. Uh, you can travel and not be an evangelist. You can preach a sermon and not be an evangelist. No, we'll talk more about it before the week is done, what the evangelist is. There is an office of the evangelist in the New Testament church, and Philip is kind of the prototype of that, but really is an example to every believer because the whole idea of the evangelist is he's working to get the good news of the gospel to as many people as possible. And so I love this. The first mention of Philip, you have what he's doing in the church, and the last mention of Philip, you have what he's doing out of the church to bring others into the church. Isn't that a glorious thought? But this morning, I don't want to talk to you about Philip the deacon. And I don't want to talk to you about Philip the evangelist. We'll come there. This morning, if you'll permit me, I'd like to talk to you for a moment about Philip the Christian. Because in reality, the greatest thing about any person is not what they do, not what others call them. Mm -mm. The greatest thing about any person is what they are. And in our world, we've given so much attention to people's titles and occupations and station in the church and stature among men. I think we've forgotten something. Would you like to know what we've forgotten? We've forgotten that we're all a bunch of black-hearted, hell-deserving sinners in desperate need of the mercy of God. And if it wasn't for Jesus, we'd all be in hell or on our way there. Praise God, I'm not there today. Better yet, I'm never going there. And do you know why? Because of Jesus. See, the great thing in Philip's life was not Philip. The great thing in Philip's life was Jesus. The great thing about any man is not what others think of him and not what he says about himself or not what he can accomplish. The great thing about any man is what God Almighty knows about him. In the words of Paul, the greatest, the greatest Christian argument that ever lived, he said that in me, in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. Look, if there's anything good in any of us, it must be Jesus because I guarantee you it's not any of us. And you don't know me, and I don't really know you. But I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing good in me. <laughs> nothing good in me. And about the time I start thinking there's something good in me, the Lord has a way of letting all the air out of my balloon. You know what I'm talking about? And reminding me how desperately sinful I am, how terribly weak I am, how utterly needful I am of the Lord. I'm going to tell you, it's not first about being a deacon. It's not first about being an evangelist. It is first and foremost and forever this. Are you a Christian? Do you know Christ? Does Christ have his rightful place in your life? When we're done, it's not Philip, I hope you know better. When we're done, it's Jesus, I hope you know better. And so what can we learn from the example of Philip? You know, I love studying the characters of the Bible. Don't you love that? One of the ladies said to me when I walked in this morning, she'd been listening to our little daily podcast, and right now we don't always do Bible characters. But right now we've been studying the life of Joseph in the Old Testament. And I've just been captured with Joseph's life, and I'm learning so many things from him. But it's really one of the great ways to study the Bible, study the characters of the Bible. You ever think about all the people you're going to get to meet when you get to heaven someday? <laughs> And you're going to say to Philip, hey, buddy, I read about you. I heard about you. I know about you. Well, what do you know about Philip? May I give you just two or three simple things today? And they all come from our text right here in Acts 6. Go back to the original passage in Acts chapter number 6. What do we learn about this original deacon and the only man ever given the title of evangelist? What, what do we mention, find mention about him in the opening section? Well, look at verse number 3. It begins this way. Wherefore, what's the next word? brethren. Would you circle that word in your Bible? That's a, that's a family word, isn't it? Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men. In other words, it was out of the brethren. It was, it was out of the family that these men were chosen. Number one, write this down. I want you to know that Philip was a family man. And you say, what do you mean by that? Usually when you say somebody's a family man, you mean by that 
they have a spouse, they have children, they love their home, they take care of their own, and by the way, I'm for all of that. In fact, this might interest you to know that in the final mention of Philip in Acts chapter number 21, guess what you find? He's a family man. He has four daughters. Now, these daughters have been trained to serve the Lord. Sounds to me like he started his first work at home. Every man's first work is always at home. Not a single person in this room is a better Christian than the Christian you are in the privacy of your home. Not one of us. If you want to know what kind of preacher I am, you can listen to a sermon. But if you want to know what kind of Christian I am, that's a different thing. You'll have to ask Tammy about that. And she'll tell you. Because <laughs> she knows me better than anybody. If you really want to know what kind of person I am, you'd have to ask Morgan and Lauren and Grant because they call me Daddy. And I'm telling you, we are what we are at home. Your first work must always be your homework. But when I say that Philip was a family man, I'm not talking about his natural family, his physical family, his earthly family. I'm talking about the greatest family in the world, the family of God. Philip was a member of God's family. I love that thought. Isn't it simple? We just miss the most obvious things. He was one of the brethren. How many of you know Jesus as your Savior? Would you raise your hand big and high? Watch this. You cannot call God your Father unless you know Jesus is your Savior. I hear people say, well, God is the Father of us all. God is the Creator of us all. But you do not come into a relationship with the Creator God of the universe as your Father until you put your faith in His only begotten Son. You see... The Lord's perfect Son, the, the well-beloved Son, came to earth and bled and died and rose again for one purpose. Would you like to know what it is? To bring every one of us into the family of God. Family was God's idea. The psalmist says that God sets the solitary in families. And I tell you, in a lonely world, it sure is glad-hearted to know you can be a part of God's family. And the sad reality is there's a whole lot of people that didn't have a good daddy. Let's just be blunt. The folks sitting in this room that didn't grow up in a home where there was a lot of love and joy and peace, and they've got a certain thing in their mind about what family looks like and what family feels like. I'm glad to report to you today that whether you had a good father or a bad father on this earth, whether he was present or whether he was absent, whether he was abusive or whether he was kind, I want you to know that God Almighty, the Heavenly Father, is the perfect Father, and He is always good to His children. And the only way you can know him as your father is you have to put your faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you something. Turn over in your New Testament to Romans for just a moment. Romans is an amazing book about salvation and about the family of God. And look at Romans chapter 8. Now, you know Romans 8. It's got one of the most famous verses in the whole Bible. Romans 8, 28, we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. But back up in the previous verses. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse number 15. Oh, I love this. Thank you, Lord, for this. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know the word Abba? Papa. It is the most tender, intimate, it's reverential, but it is, it is very personal, Abba, Father. Did you know there's only one person in the whole Bible that ever prayed that, that's recorded that he prayed, Abba, Father? You'd like to guess who it is? That's right. Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Think about this. <laughs> this is glorious. Jesus made a way so that you could have the same access to the Father that he has to the Father. He came out of that grave. He said to Mary, he said, go tell the disciples that I'm, I've not yet ascended to my father and your father. Hallelujah for this. Jesus made a way so that his father could be my father. You see all three members of the Godhead here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You want to talk about the perfect family. The, the, the family that from eternity past lived in unbroken union and communion. That's the perfect family. The Godhead. God made a way so that we could come into fellowship with the perfect family. Look at verse number 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Not going to be. We are right now. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be all so glorified together. Do you understand that the child of God has an awful lot to look forward to someday? Did you know that there's a big family reunion being planned at our Father's house right now? 
It's the biggest reunion you've ever seen in your life. You've never seen a supper like the one we're getting ready to attend. And you know who you're seated around today? If you're a Christian and the people around you are really Christians, watch please. They are not just friends or, or fellow church attenders. They are family members. They are brothers and sisters because we have the same Heavenly Father. I was born into a wonderful family. I thank God for my dad and mom. The preacher said, Dad and I got to travel together this week. And he's pastored the same church for 33 years. And I thank God for his faithfulness, and I love my dad, love my mother. Uh, he's preaching in Texas today, and I prayed for them this morning and thank God for them. But I'm going to just tell you something. I'm not a member of the family of God because I'm a member of their family. See, nobody gets into God's family by being born into the right family. And nobody's kept out of the family of God because you were born into the wrong family. Listen to me. God made it so that everybody gets saved the same way. There's only two ways you can come into any family. What are they? Tell me. What are they? The most obvious way is what? You are what? You're born. That's good. This is a very bright group, all right? So you're born, you come into the family. There is another way. There's another way to come into a family. Anybody know what it is? Tell me. What is it? Adoption. That's right. Study your New Testament. Do you realize that salvation is, is symbolized in two ways in the New Testament? Watch this. It is the new birth, and it is adoption. Somebody says, which is it? Yes. It's both. You must be what? Born again. And yet we just read in Romans chapter 8 that you've received the spirit of adoption. Why would the Lord, oh, it says glory. Why would the Lord use both of those pictures to typify coming into the family of God? Look, because it is so miraculous and so wonderful, it takes every aspect of our understanding to reveal what it is to come into the family of our God. It is the miraculous, supernatural, spiritual birth that only God can accomplish. And at the very same time, it is that work of our sovereign God, His power and might that brings us by adoption and choice into the family of God. I tell you, there is nothing like being a member of God's family. He comes to live in your house now, and you get to go live in His house for all eternity. That sounds pretty good to me. And so, number one, what is Philip the Christian? He's... A member of the family of God. Go back to Acts 6 and let me show you a second thing quickly. He's not only in the family, but he was faithful. The Bible says these were men of honest report. How many of you think men ought to be honest? How many of you have lived long enough in this lying, deceitful, guile-filled world to know a lot of men aren't honest? But do you know the word honest here does not simply mean he told the truth. And I think you ought to tell the truth. But it doesn't simply mean that he told the truth. Watch this, please. It means he lived the truth. His life lined up with what he professed. He, he didn't just say he was a Christian. He wasn't just called one of the brethren. He didn't just carry the name. He had a true testimony and the spirit of service in him. This was a man that did not just name the name of Christ, he was a true follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you what God wants for every person in this room. You ready? So you don't know us. No, but I know God, and I'm going to tell you what God wants for every person in this room. He wants you to be a member of his family. Don't you leave here today without being in the family of God. Repent of your sin, put your faith in Jesus, and receive eternal life. And in an instant of time, the miraculous work of grace, you can be a member of the family of God. But don't you stop there. See, there's a lot of saved people who are not faithful people. And I don't know about you. I'd like to live my life in such a way when it's all done, somebody will say, that was a faithful man. Forget the talents. Forget the abilities. Forget the accolades of men. Just let them say this of us. He was a faithful man. That verse you alluded to earlier, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Paul said, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The gentlemen, ladies, young people, I'm going to tell you the one thing every Christian in this room can be. You may not be much, but you can be one thing. You can be faithful to Jesus Christ. You can come to the end of your race and stand as a faithful servant and kneel as a faithful servant in the nail-pierced feet of Jesus Christ. May God raise up an army of Phillips this week, men and women and young people that say, by the grace of God, we don't want to just say we're saved. We want to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And for the record, I'll point something out to you. This was not something Philip said of himself. It was something others observed of him. Let me ask you a question. 
And we ask the people that you do business with, your next door neighbors, the folks that you have your exchanges with day by day, would any of them say, I'll tell you one thing about that man, he's a real Christian. Would anybody say, I know that family. Yeah, they're not perfect, but I'll tell you one thing. I think that family really knows God. That woman really knows the Lord. Be a family member and be a faithful person. And then there's a third thing. Look again at verse th 3. Seven men of honest report, mark it please, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. See, we want to jump to what they got to be over. See the last part of the verse? What they got to be over. I'm just going to tell you, a true Christian is not concerned about who they get to be over. They're reminded of who they're under. We want to jump to the business. Forget that. you got things out of order. you got to start at the first part of this verse. Are you a member of the family? Are you a faithful Christian? And then here's the real test. Are you full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom? This man was a man who was overflowing with God. Look at the divine order here. It doesn't say he was full of wisdom and the Holy Ghost. Look at it. It says he was full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. The Holy Spirit is the root. The wisdom is the fruit. We need wisdom. Can we get an agreement on that? Yes. Do you need wisdom to guide your affairs? Do you need wisdom for decisions? Do you need wisdom to teach your children? Do you need wisdom to navigate this crazy world we're living in right now? I'm going to tell you what you need. You need the Holy Spirit. Read James chapter number 3, this description of the wisdom that comes from above. It is, it is not some fleshly carnal wisdom. It is spiritual wisdom. And who puts it in us? Only the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And I love the way he moves from the spiritual to the practical. Look, the Holy Ghost living in you gives you wisdom to deal with everything with which you have to deal. Hey, Philip, we've got some mundane work for you to do. Well, that sounds exciting, doesn't it? Hey, Philip, we're going to put you in charge of the widow's tables. It's okay. Because the Holy Spirit of God in me is going to make even that work the most wonderful work. The Holy Spirit is going to give me wisdom to do it. And He's going to give me joy in doing it. The Holy Spirit is going to shed light in every bit of the shadows. Look, I'm going to enjoy whatever it is God gives me to do. Why? Because I am filled with the Holy Spirit. May I ask you, are you filled with the Holy Spirit this morning? I'm not asking, do others think you are? Are you at this moment? I'm not asking, have you ever been or do you want to be or do you think you should be? I'm asking, at this moment, are you a Spirit-filled Christian? That's not just being saved. No, no, no. That's not just having the Holy Spirit in you. Because you've received Christ as your Savior. That is saying, my life has now been yielded to the control of the Holy Spirit. And he just, he's invaded every part. He, he's got it all. I'm all his. Let's take a survey. How many of you think the preacher ought to be spirit-filled? Would you raise your hand? I do too. I'll let you in a little secret. It's not just the preacher that's supposed to be spirit-filled. Philip's not the pastor of the church. Philip's just a servant in the church. Philip's not one of the apostles. He's just a man doing his part. And yet the Bible says here he is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Look, you can't all be deacons and we won't all be evangelists, but we can all be this kind of Christian. I ask again, are you a spirit-filled person? Let me demonstrate what I'm talking about for just a moment. Excuse me just a second. I hope I put on good socks this morning. I think I did. We're about to find out. I did, praise God. <laughs> you see that shoe? It's a nice shoe, isn't it? Cleaned up, all shined up for church. Bought and paid for, too. I'm making payments on other things. That is paid for. Isn't that good? <laughs> now watch. Get up and walk to the back of this church. I said, get up, walk to the back of this church. How many of you think we're going to be here a while? <laughs> Some, that's nonsense, preacher. Mm -hmm. But fill it with me. And suddenly, it does whatever I want to do. You want to know the problem in churches today? We got a bunch of Christians 
bought and paid for, spit, shine, and polished, sitting on church pews, listening to guys like me scream at them and tell them what they ought to do. Excuse me. And there's not so much as a holy grunt. Nobody moving forward. Stale, stagnant, dead, and dying. You want to know why? Because they're not spirit-filled people. But you let those same church members get filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm going to tell you what will happen. They'll go everywhere God wants them to go, and they'll do everything God wants them to do, and they'll be everything Jesus saved them to become. Amen. I'm going to tell you the need this week. I'm not here on a recruiting mission for deacons. I'm not even here on a recruiting mission first for evangelists. I'm here on a recruiting mission for real Christians. Don't you know we need a revival of real Christianity in our world today? Settle the fact you're saved and know you're saved. Have no doubt about it. Determined by the grace of God, I'll be a faithful follower of Jesus. And then, dear Lord, I want to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that out of my life will flow and grow every beautiful good thing. Dear Lord, don't just let me receive the blessing. Make me a channel through which the work of God can be done in this world. This is the message of Philip the Christian. And I want to stand up first this morning and say, dear Lord, let me get in that line. I'd like to be in that number. I was preaching a revival meeting in North Georgia a few years ago. One afternoon, I took a little jog, decided to take a run, and ran outside of town, just a little tiny town. When I got outside of town on this little lonely road, there was a, a cemetery, an old Civil War cemetery off to my right. And I, I love history, and I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take a little detour through this cemetery. Did you know you run faster when you run through cemeteries? It's an amazing thing. I mean, you really set some time. And I made the loop and all the way around, all those little white crosses. And I got back to the front, coming out of the cemetery, and I looked to my right. I don't know how I missed it coming in. The largest memorial and monument in the whole place was just to my right. Huge, beautiful. And I thought to myself, that must be a general. I mean, that must be somebody really important. And I went over and looked, and it was somebody really important. But it wasn't a general. It was a wife and mother. Biggest monument in the whole cemetery. It had her name. It had her birth year and death year and the little dash between that represents a whole lot of living. And then her epitaph. You know an epitaph. Somebody boils your whole life down to a line. And I stood there dumbfounded at her epitaph. It was so profound, so simple, but so profound. I took my phone out and I called my wife and I said, I'm, I'm standing in a cemetery. She said, you're what? I said, I'm standing in a cemetery. I was on a little run. I said, but I've just seen a grave marker. And I think it may be the greatest thing I've ever seen on a grave marker. I said, matter of fact, when I die... I hope something like this could be put on my grave marker. She said, what is it? It very simply said, she lived and died as a Christian. <laughs> and it hit me, standing there looking at that grave marker. I can see it now. Everybody wants to die as a Christian. But not everybody wants to live as a Christian. How many of you would like to die as a Christian? Then live as one. Let them say your name and say, that's a Christian. Our Father, I pray today that you will take the example of Philip and make it alive in our souls. Oh, dear God, help us be true Christians. Spirit of God, do your work in us now. For Jesus' sake. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we sit very still and quiet for a moment. Nobody's looking in this room except this preacher because I don't want to embarrass you. I won't embarrass you. I give you my word. I don't know what you're accustomed to. I don't like to be humiliated and so I'm not in the business of humiliating others. But I am going to ask you to be an honest person. Please be an honest person. Not just with me, with God. Don't you know it's dangerous to lie to a God who knows us? He knows the truth about us. 
How many people in this room today can honestly say, Preacher, if I died right now, I mean right now, in the next 60 seconds, and stood before God, there's no doubt in my mind, I have been saved. My sins have been forgiven. I, I've experienced that new birth, and I know I'm a member of the family of God. Preacher, I know I'm one of the Lord's children. That much is settled. I want you to lift your hand high in the air with mine and keep it up just a moment. You say, I'm certain of that. With your hand lifted to the Lord, would you just thank God for that right now? Just right where you sit, say, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins and saving my soul. Because if it wasn't for Jesus, you couldn't say that. That's not about you being a church member or a good person. It's about Christ. You may lower your hands. Now, some of us could not raise our hands with certainty and confidence today. And I want to thank you. I really mean that. I want to thank you for not lying to the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you again if you'll be a truthful man, a truthful woman, a truthful young person. I'm not going to point you out, come try to get you. I want to pray for you. I love you, and the Lord loves you. So I want to ask, who among us today would say, Preacher, I couldn't raise my hand a moment ago with confidence and certainty because I am not 100% sure that my sins have been forgiven and that Jesus is my Savior. Preacher, I'm not positive that I'm ready to go to heaven, but I'm sure of this. I don't want to go to hell. Preacher, would you pray for me? I'm not certain of my salvation. I'd like you to slip your hand in the air with mine long enough for me to see it and then pull it right back down. Thank you, dear one. Pray for me. I'm not certain of my relationship to God. Thank you. And you, pray for me. I'm not certain of this. If you just raised your hand, or you didn't, but you should have, I'd like you to listen to me for a minute. Nobody in this room knows who you are except me, you, and Jesus. But I'm talking just to you. If I could sit down in your living room, this is what I would say to you. God loves you. Just exactly like you are, God loves you. And Jesus Christ, God's Son, died for your sins. Do you believe that? That's what the Bible teaches. He died for your sins. Your sin could not be any greater than His grace. That's impossible. His grace is greater than all. And the really good news, you ready for the good news? The really good news is that not only did He die for your sins, He rose from the dead so you could have eternal life. He's alive. He wants to come live in your heart. He wants you to live with Him for eternity. I don't know how you got here today, but I know this, God got you here. Do you believe in divine appointments? I do too. And He had me here today to speak and you here today to listen. And He had us all here today because He wants you to be a member of His family. He wants you to be one of His children, to be a, a true Christian. And I don't know. I don't know what's been in your mind or your past, what's kept you from this, but I know this. The Bible says, Jesus promised, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Let me tell you what that means. It means if you'll come to Jesus, he'll come to you. Isn't that great? If you'll take him as your Savior, he'll take you into his family. That's God's promise. I'm not asking you to get up, give a speech, join a church, be a better person. I'm asking you this morning if you would take God at His word. If you would repent of your sin right where you sit and place your faith in Jesus Christ. How simple is it? This simple. The Bible says you believe in your heart. God raised Him from the dead. You confess Him with your mouth. Thou shalt be saved. Isn't that simple? We want to make a checklist out of it, don't we? Figure it all out. Fix it all. No, no. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you a whosoever? Then it's for you. I said I was going to ask every person to join me in one of two prayers. Here's the first. If you're in this room or listening to me today and you're not certain of your relationship to God, you're not positive that you really have been saved, you don't know that for sure, I'm going to invite you in just a moment to join me in a simple prayer that you can make your own. A prayer of repentance and faith a prayer you can pray from your heart to God. You're not talking to me. I, I'm not your priest. I can't save you. But you're talking to God. And I tell you, God will listen. God will hear an answer if you'll take him at his word. Every person in this room, if you raised your hand or you didn't, but you know you need to be saved, or you're watching online and right where you are, you know you need to be saved, I'm going to ask you right now if you'll join me in this prayer. Will you? From your heart, would you pray something like this to God? Dear God. 
right now, dear God, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. And no one else can save me. But I do believe that Jesus died for my sins. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you rose from the dead. Forgive my sins. Come into my life and save me now. Jesus, I trust you today to be my personal Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for keeping your promise and giving me eternal life. Help me to follow you as a true Christian from this day forward. Our heads are bowed and nobody's looking but this preacher. I'm going to give you a verse. If you just prayed that prayer, I'm going to give you a verse. The Bible says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I'm a Christian. I know that's true. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm grateful. If I gave you a million dollars this morning, you wouldn't be embarrassed. You'd be excited. <laughs> and if you just took Jesus as your Savior, you got something, buddy, a whole lot better than a million dollars. You could never spend it up. It's called eternal life. So I don't think you'll be embarrassed to tell me. I want to ask right now, who here would say, Brother Scott, I just prayed that prayer from my heart, and I meant it, and this morning I'm trusting Jesus. Right where I'm sitting, I'm trusting Jesus to be my personal Savior, and I'm not ashamed or embarrassed to tell you that. I want you to raise your hand in the air with mine right now. Would you please? You say, I prayed that prayer and invited Jesus into my heart. Raise it up big and high. Thank you. And thank you and you. Who else? Raise it up big and high. I prayed, invited Jesus into my heart to be my Savior. If you just raised your hand, would you lift your head and look at me right now? Nobody's looking but me and you. Thank you. I want to look you in the eye and tell you, congratulations. Great decision you ever made. Would you look at me just a moment? I want to give you my word on something. I will not embarrass you. Will you trust me on that one? I will not embarrass you. Young man, did you mean business that you trusted Jesus? Sir, did you mean business? Ma'am, did you mean business? Here's what I'm going to ask. We won't make you give a speech. The pastor and his wife are going to come stand right here with Bible in their hand. The rest of these folks don't know it, but I'm getting ready to ask everybody else to join me in a prayer. They're going to come and pray. I don't want you lost in the shuffle. I want somebody to have a prayer with you. I want them to give you something to read when you go home about following Jesus now as a Christian and encourage you. So we want to help you. Pastor, I want you and your wife, if you will, to come stand right here with your Bible. And I'm going to ask each of you that today invited Jesus into your heart to be your Savior. Before anybody else moves and while nobody's looking but us, I'm going to ask you right now, if you get out of your seat and come tell them, I'm trusting Jesus today as my Savior. Come on right now. God bless you. Wonderful. Will you come and let us have a prayer with you? Thank you so much. Praise God for it. Amen. You're getting it settled today? Let us encourage you and rejoice with you. Maybe, maybe you say, well, I didn't pray. Come on. Somebody's here to pray with you. Amen. Maybe you still have questions and want to talk to somebody. There would never be a better day. It won't be any easier than this moment for somebody to open the Scriptures and answer those questions for you. We wait just a moment longer. Who else? You say, I want to trust Jesus today as my Savior. I don't want to leave with doubts. I don't want to leave with that Jesus. Oh, dear one, don't leave with that Jesus today. Please don't leave with that Christ. We want you in God's family. Come to Him now. Now, there could be others today who need to be baptized or join the church. At any moment, you can come, find someone here at the front, and we'll help you with that. But I want to speak to all the Christians for just a moment, to every believer in this room. You said you're saved. You, you raised your hand. You professed to know Christ. Wonderful. Let's get down to business, shall we? It's the beginning of our revival meeting. This is the starting point. Number one, how many believers in the room would say, Preacher, I'm saved, but I don't think... I can say today that I've been as faithful as I ought to be or that I am as full of the Holy Spirit as I ought to be. Today I realize I'm a Christian. I'm saved, no doubt about that. But God's doing a work in my heart. I need to be more the person He saved me to be. That's me. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand with mine right now all over this room? If you mean it, will you stand up right where you are? Just stand to your feet right where you are. You'll say, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. But I know in my heart 
God's dealing with me, God's speaking to me as a Christian man, a Christian woman, a Christian young person, that I need to be more faithful and I need to be a spirit-filled Christian. And that's what I want. You say, I want to join the ranks of the Phillips. It may not be the most prominent like Stephen, may not be the most famous, but I want to be a faithful, full Christian. If you're standing, I'd like you to lift your head and look at me, would you please? Now, I rejoice in those today who are trusting Jesus. Aren't you happy about that? But I want you to know, friends, if we're going to see the work of God move forward and the church multiplied, it's going to take some people like the ones I'm looking at right now, getting as close to God as they can and full of the Lord and saying, Lord, I want all you got for me. That's what Philip did. And I'm going to ask today if you'll be with that person. I think this morning we won't have any music at all so that everybody can pray and the only sound will be the sound of people talking to the Lord. I'm going to count to three when I do. I'm going to ask all of you that are standing, if you're physically able. If you're not, pray where you are. God understands that. But if you're physically able, I'm going to ask you, first meeting, to leave your seat. Come join me at this old-fashioned altar. And you can kneel, stand, sit, whatever you need to do. And we're going to pray today in the beginning of this conference that God will help us be the Christians He wants us to be. One, two, three. Quickly, quietly. Just leave your place and come find you a place of prayer here. Come and tell the Lord what you just told me. I'd like to challenge you to be more specific with him. Be more specific with him than you've been with me. The area of your life that God has spoken to you about. Talk to him about it. Call it by name. Oh, Lord, we're grateful we're believers, but make us an example of the believers. That's what we want to be. Oh, Lord, I pray if there's another single soul in this room without Jesus, you'll save them before they leave today. Bring Holy Spirit conviction to their heart, certainty of their need, and a willingness to yield to Christ. Father, if there are Christians who are away from you and not yet surrendered, May the Word work in them. May the power of the Holy Spirit work in them. And Father, for all of us who are now calling out to Thee from our hearts, dear Lord, make us true Christians. We're grateful to be in the family, but make us honest people, faithful people, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Make us people you can use. Lord, help us to live so we can die as Christians. I ask now that the sweet spirit of heaven would continue to work in the hearts of people, even as we depart in a few moments, that we will not soon forget the word we have heard, that you will water the seed and it will bring forth much fruit, Lord, and fruit that remains, and that all week as we go into the word of God, the word will enter into us. Oh, Lord, Use this week in our lives to make us the Christians who saved us to be. And I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.